All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, quantum computation. Uh, in this video, I am going to uh, show you how to use Google Collaboratory uh, to run uh, QIS kit programs. Now, QIS kit, as uh, you all may be familiar with, is IBM's uh, platform uh, for writing programs, quantum, comp uh, quantum programs, and which can be uh, run on uh, IBM's quantum machines, or uh, you can use the software simulator provided with the with QIS kit uh, to, to model uh, your system before uh, actually executing it on the IBM quantum computer. All right, so what I'm gonna use for this purpose is a platform which is known as Colab or Collaboratory. And you just go to, uh, you just say Google Colab. Uh, if you just say Colab, right uh, this is the collaboratory uh, right so it's a uh, it's a take on uh, collaboration and laboratory right so it's a concatenation of those two words so when you go there uh, you will get a prompt which will ask you uh, if you would like to uh, use some notebooks which you might already have, or uh, you can open example notebooks. Uh, and so that there are a lot of example notebooks uh, which will show you how to use, well, which are basically just Python programs. And then you can access uh, files from Google Drive, or you can import uh, a GitHub repository, and you can also upload your own file. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say new notebook because I just want to start completely fresh. Now, what we want to do is we want to run QIS kit programs. So in order to run QIS kit programs in Colab, after a little bit of Googling, what you find is that one has to execute this command in uh, Google Colab. So, oops, what did I just do? I didn't want to do that. Right, one second. Okay, so this is the Google Collab window. Uh, let's uh, call our, give our notebook a name. Uh, QIS get tutorial, uh, let's see part one, and let's put the date. What's the date is January 22, 2022. All right, now, what this is, is basically, uh, it's a version of what is known as the Jupyter Notebook. And in another video that I'm planning, I will show you how to um, run QI, programming QIS kit uh, on your own local computer, in case you don't have an internet connection, or if you prefer you know, to just program locally. All right, so we want to run this command. Right, so let, let me just uh, quickly uh, tell you what uh, these various uh, expressions mean, okay? So uh, Google Colab or any other program, it, it, whether it runs online or offline, it runs in something called a shell, right? So a shell looks like this. It's, it's, it's basically a command line terminal, uh, right? So this is how all operating systems get started. They start in the form of a terminal. And so this is where uh, Google, the worksheet is actually running. Of course, the terminal is hosted on Google's servers. And so these terminals are all uh, Linux based. And so there are certain Linux commands that you can use. For instance, if I want to view 
the files in a particular folder, I say ls. If I want to view the working directory, I say pwd. If I want to say cwd, well, cwd is not a command, oops. Uh, then I can say cd dot dot and cd and so on, right? These are all the basic commands. It's similar to what is used in, in, in the Windows shell. Uh, all right, so for it, but now when I'm running, when I'm working with this uh, notebook, I want to run commands in the shell. What do I do? I, I start with an exclamation mark. So if I say bang ls, now if I want to run this, I press shift enter. And it's a little slow, well, because first of all, it has to uh, go to the Google server. It has to connect with the shell. Then the shell has to say that, okay, well, is there something to be listed? And you can see that it says sample data. So this is the only thing that is present in the folder. And for instance, I can say pwd, that will give me the name of my local directory. It's just something like slash content. Okay, so now, and, and then of course, there are some other uh, options that you can use with such commands. For example, if I say ls with dash al, uh, that will give me, hopefully it does give me a few more details. It lists all the files and uh, a, so the, this option al, it lists all the files. And you can see that here there is a file called config. And while I'm at it, I might as well just show you what is in this config file. So the way to do it is to use a shell command known as more. Uh, what more does is basically, oops, and config is a directory, not a, so I can't do more. So first let me go to cd config. cd stands for uh, change directory. Okay, uh, let me, let me make sure, of course, I have to press shift enter every time I want to. Okay, well, I guess I uh, can't access config. Okay, well, for whatever reason. Oops, I forgot to, and you will notice here that I forgot to uh, preface the command with an exclamation, but it still worked. I guess, I guess Google Colab is smart enough to know the difference between a shell command and a code. Anyways, you can see the config directory has all this, all these various information. Uh, so just for uh, the sake of fun, we can see what is in the logs directory and you can see where the logs directory has some information. Anyway, so we want to run uh, QIS kit. So for this purpose, we need to install QIS kit in the, uh, in the environment uh, that is being run. It's called a virtual machine that's being run on the Google servers. And since QIS kit is a Python module, we, we want to use, uh, so we want to use something called the Python package manager. And uh, that is invoked using a command known as pip or PIP. And so we would type PIP install, which obviously means well, if you want to install something, then the name of the package or packages. So we want to install two packages and those are QIS kit and IPy widgets. IPy widgets stands for IPython widgets. And those are some useful tools that are needed. Anyways, so you can see that uh, the shell is working. Uh, IPy widgets is already installed here. Uh, and it is downloading uh, QIS kit and, of, and it has dozens of requirements. So it has to install all of those other packages on which QIS kit depends, right? And I think it's, it's, it's fairly fast. Okay, so it says successfully installed uh, QIS kit and so on and so forth. All right, good, let the games begin. Now, one thing to notice is that when I move my mouse over this line and this region over here, this is called a cell. This is a single cell. And this button is the run cell button, right? You will see uh, that I have an option to either say plus code. So this will add a 
code cell and you will see that Google is also helpfully showing me a shortcut key, control M B that will add a code cell. And this is a text cell now, doesn't seem to be any shortcut for a text cell, um, but I'll just try something. So another thing is that when you're working in these notebooks, there is a command mode and an edit mode. So what is a command mode? So for instance, when I click on this cell, you can start to see a blinking cursor, right? So this is my command mode, uh, sorry, edit mode. And in this, I can start writing my, my, my lines, right? So for instance, if I want to execute, uh, if I want to uh, start with QIS kit, well, you know what? I'm just going to copy some, uh, some code from another notebook that I have open. I'm going to post it here. All right. So, and I'll tell you what each one of these lines does. Oops, it's the wrong notebook. I'm going to tell you what each one of these lines does in a second. But right now we are in the edit mode, right? So we have added code uh, in our cell. And how do we run it? Well, we say control enter or shift enter. Both of those work, right? So what this does is the first line. So this is all Python, by the way. So you're now you're coding in Python. So the first line, oops, what was that? I didn't want to do that. You import a package which is called numpy. And this is very important that you say it correctly uh, at the risk of uh, being sent to uh, numpy jail. It's not numpy, it's numpy. And you import numpy as np. So the reason you do that is just so that every time you want to get something from num numpy, instead of typing numpy, numpy dot sign, you can just say np dot sign. And apparently the, and you can see that the, the odd autocomplete feature uh, is working. So when, when you type something like np dot, uh, well, it shows a whole list of all the possible uh, functions and attributes and objects and classes that are within numpy. So I want uh, sin, let's say, right? Sign, and then let's say, what is sign of numpy.py, right? And well, that should be zero. Of course, uh, it is giving me a number which is very close to zero. Then the second line here tells me that from QIS kit import star. So this imports everything, all the code from QIS kit. And the way this way of importing is different from the first line, because in the first line, when I say import numpy as in P, I'm importing the module. And then whenever I want to use any code within the module, I have to say something like np.sign, so and so. But when I write from QIS kit import star, what that does is that if there is any code in QIS kit that I want to use, I don't have to write QIS kit dot. I can just use the name of the code. For instance, uh, we will be using something called quantum circuit. So let's see if uh, the Google autocomplete shows it. And you can see that it does. It shows a pop-up of quantum circuit and quantum register. These are, these are two uh, functions. And then we have used a third command here. This is a different kind of command. It is something which is preceded by a percent sign, percentage, right? And it says percent matplotlib inline. So matplotlib is a mathematical plotting library uh, that is one of the core components of Python. And when you say percent, so per this is not exactly Python, um, you know, uh, what would you call it? Uh, Python code, this, when you write percent, you can only do this in, inside, a, inside a notebook. And it's it's called a, it's called a, what's it called? It's called a magic command. It's called a magic command. So when you write percent matplotlib inline, what this says is that well we will be generating figures like circuit plots and so on, and those will be shown in line. That means uh, within the notebook, you will see what it means precisely later on, rather than in a separate window. Okay. 
All right. All right, so let's look at our, uh, uh, take our very first steps in quantum computation. Okay. Oops, looks like uh, there's been a bit of a hang here. Might have to refresh it. Okay, <clears throat> so what we want to do now is, uh, well, let's, let's dive right in. That means let's make a quantum circuit, uh, right? So how do we do that? Uh, well, let's, let's look at uh, this. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make a circuit which creates something known as a, a GH, a Z state. But before that, uh, we'll do something simpler, which is, We'll make a circuit uh, that has just one qubit, okay? So, well, we start with something like this. Quantum circuit, N1. So what this uh, command tells us, so the left-hand side is the name of a variable which we are initializing and this variable will store the details of our circuit. And the right-hand side is, uh, a, we, are, we are calling, uh, this, this, is an ob, this is a class quantum circuit. And so when we, when we write this function uh, with, the curly, with the curly brackets or with the ordinary brackets, and we say one, one is the argument. So what this does is it creates an object, which is a circuit with a single gate. Uh, sorry, with a single qubit, and it returns that to us. Now, when we are in uh, this notebook interface, if you type the name of a variable, then something generally happens. In this case, it, it tells us that, okay, well, this is an object, uh, which is an element of the quantum circuit class, which is itself, uh, uh, subclass of this other of class, which is subclass of the circuit class, which is a subclass of OIS gate. And then uh, this number tells us the memory address of that object, again, which is not relevant for our purposes. In, in Python, we have another uh, tool, which is, which, which is very useful and which you, know, you will probably use very frequently, which is the following. So if you want to know what is an object? Uh, what are the functions? What are the properties? Well, you type the name of the object and then you put a question mark and then you press enter. And so now you see on the right hand side over here, we have a help page which has shown up. And uh, it, so it tells us that this is an object of type quantum circuit. It has a string form, it's just Q length is zero because we have not added anything to it. We've added any gates. This is the file. It tells us that uh, the code for this circuit lives in this, this particular file. Um, and then doc string, this is where the information goes about uh, the object, right? So what this tells us, it creates a new circuit. A circuit is a list of instructions bound to some register. That tells us args, arg stands for arguments. Right, so what are the possible arguments that you can give uh, this uh, <clears throat> this uh, this command quantum circuit, which is known as a constructor? So what are the arguments that you can pass to a to a constructor? And uh, for instance, we have just passed a single number, which is one, but you could also pass uh, something as an argument, something like this, which is quantum register four. And as you can imagine what this does, it, it creates um, a quantum register, uh, which has, which can hold four qubits and then returns that. And then that object is sent as an argument to quantum circuit. 
And so for instance, you can see that if a list of int, uh, the amount of uh, qubits and our classical bits. So remember that quantum circuits can consist of both quantum bits and also classical bits or C bits, right? So if you say something like quantum circuit four, that's a quantum circuit with four qubits. And then if you specify a second argument, so separated from the first one by a comma, what it does is it makes a circuit with four quantum bits and three classical bits. All right, and then there are other more other options which you know uh, you can always refer to if you do need to uh, make it. All right. So now this this uh, help uh, menu also gives us examples. All right. And well, before that, I should mention. Uh, so so these are the arguments, and then this is another section which is raises. Now, what does that mean, raises? Well, in programming, there is uh, a method, uh, a functionality, which is known as exception handling. So any program is we are bound to make errors. And so whenever there are errors in a program, uh, they are known as exceptions. And so, the, so if we implement exception handling, then we are following good, good coding practice. So, this uh, quantum circuit class, it raises the following exception. Uh, this is, which is goes by the name of circuit error. And, <clears throat> and this is another type of a class, another type of an object. So, well, uh, this is something that is important to uh, keep in mind uh, when you write big, big programs. All right, so now let's, uh, let's do, let's, let's just follow, uh, these commands and see what they're doing, okay? So let's see, we say quantum circuit uh, two uh, or two, two. And we, so what this does is it creates a quantum circuit with two classical bits and uh, two quantum bits. Now, remember that at the beginning of this file, uh, we had uh, inserted a command, this command here, matplotlib, this magic uh, shell command, which is percentage matplotlib inline. So now we'll see how this works. Okay, so before we have added any, uh, any, any, any gates or anything, let's just see what it gives us. So circuit.draw, well, right now our circuit is empty. It doesn't have anything, right? So, well, all it shows us are two, three empty slots, two for the qubits and well, uh, this is for the classical bits. So now let's, let's add uh, a gate. And this is a gate that will act on the first qubit. So now the qubits, as you can see, are numbered starting from zero. And since there are two quantum bits, the first one is numbered zero, the second one is numbered one. And the same thing is true for the classical bits. So let, let's do the following. Let's type this command, okay? And we'll see what it does, okay? So actually, when you hover your mouse over this, something nice happens, right? What is that? Yeah, okay, there we go. So what it is showing, in this pop-up, it is giving you, uh, showing you the help uh, text for the for this H object, right? So what what is this H? Uh, it applies something called the Hardamard gate. Okay, so H is the uh, short form of the Hardamard gate, and when we say zero, that tells us that we are applying this to the very first qubit in the set. Okay. Now again, let's just draw it and see if anything has changed. All right, so now you can see that our circuit is taking on uh, uh, some form. So our first qubit, uh, the wire we have inserted in a hard amount gate, our second qubit is untouched and our two classical bits are also untouched. So what does what precisely does a hard amount gate do? Right now, uh, 
Um, let me show you another. Um, another characteristic or the property of uh, these Jupiter cells, uh, which is that instead of writing code, one can also uh, insert, insert text. So let's see, uh, let me close this help menu really quickly. And then, uh, Okay, no, that's not what I want to do. One second. Okay, no, I don't want to add a comment. Okay, well, let me just press this button, P for text. All right, so this opens up a code, a text cell, right? So now we can uh, type in text. <clears throat> and this is all, this is one of the great things about um, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which is what Google Collab is also based on, all right? Only the thing is that this, is a somewhat more fancy text editor than the one you would find in the Jupyter Notebook. And one great thing about uh, these cells is the following, that you can enter mathematical expressions of this form. And well, there are two great things. The first is that you can enter expressions. The second thing, which is really nice, is that on the right side of the cell, you have this something called a live preview, right? So as I'm entering the expressions, uh, the uh, notebook is rendering them into the mathematical symbols as they will actually show on the screen and showing me the, the output, right? So I, I, don't, I will not make mistakes, hopefully. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you what, for instance, what is the hard mark gate right so the hardamart gate is a matrix okay so let's let's uh, type in uh, and again this is really nice google collab is uh, showing us uh, when we are in in this latex mode it is showing us a pop up which contains a list of uh, all possible latex commands this is actually quite brilliant uh, so let's see B matrix, and then we say enter. Uh, wait a minute, I think I'm making a mistake. So let me fix that. Slash begin, right? This is the command, slash begin. And come on, Google, give me something. Uh, begin B matrix. And then does this do anything? Does this not do anything? Okay. Well, this doesn't seem to do anything. Uh, okay. You know what, let me type array, begin array, and then end array. And then let's see, does that do anything? Well, let's just give it a moment. Now, let me enter the elements of this, of this array, right? So this is a matrix. Uh, okay, now you can see that the rendering is working once I've started entering my my information. Okay. I'm waiting for it to. Uh, 
Well, let me just press shift enter and see if that gives me. Okay, I guess it doesn't. One second. Um, well, let's try something else. Let's try bacon equation. and equation and does it recognize what's going on? All right, so for whatever reason, uh, now the code seems to be working. And as you can see, uh, it has the following form. This is what a simple, very simple LaTeX uh, expression looks like. Uh, LaTeX commands all begin with a backslash. And just to remind you, a backslash uh, is, is the following. Uh, it is, oops, what happened? There's a difference between the backslash and a forward slash. So if you want to type a backward slash, it is this. And if you want to type a forward slash, it is this. So you can see uh, that one is tilted backwards. It's like a backwards means in the opposite direction to that in which we are writing, right? And so all LaTeX commands uh, begin with a backslash. So here you have a command uh, which says slash begin. And then there is curly, uh, curly braces. So within the curly braces, it says align. So this is how you begin what is called in LaTeX an environment. So I am using an align environment. So align is a kind of a environment in which I can write mathematical equations. And as the name suggests, I can align them. Then in the next line, I say H is equal to, and then I want to insert a matrix. Now a matrix is also inserted using an environment. In this case, the environment is called P matrix environment. So once again, I use slash begin B matrix and all the environments have to end with a slash end command, backslash end, right? And the endings and the beginnings have to be nested properly. So for instance, the end B matrix command cannot come after the end align command. One environment has to be nested within another. So this is the begin B matrix. And then I enter the elements. So I, you see, I don't have to specify the number of rows and columns. That is entirely up to me uh, to how many elements I want to insert. So for instance, here, I just put another element here. And what this did was it inserted a, set, a third column, right? And I didn't have to say anything. Uh, you know, it LaTeX understood that, okay, this is three columns and that means this, that's a maximum number of columns. That means the whole thing has to be the uh, three, uh, three by two matrix. Now, and the ampersand uh, is the separator. It separates uh, different cell contents. And then here you have these, this uh, double backslash. So in LaTeX double backslash means the end of a line. And so it signifies the fact that we have uh, completed the ent entry of the first row of elements and we want to start the entry of the second row so we want to put a double black slash and then one ampersand minus one. So we get this, and this is called the Hardamard matrix. Okay. Let's see. And no. Hardamard. Okay. Okay, and here I am using another aspect of um, writing in uh, Colab. This is shared with many, many other tools these days in Jupyter and most other kinds of notebooks and so on and so forth, which is that I'm using a set of formatting commands which go under the name of Markdown, M-A-R-K, 
So let me write that down for you. Markdown. And there are various versions of Markdown. Uh, that is GitHub Markdown um, and, uh, well, many others that I <laughs> too, too, too numerous to list. So here in this expression, if, I, if you put two, uh, as two stars, uh, two asterisks, and then end with two asterisks, what it does is it converts the text within that into a bold format. And if you put just one uh, set of asterisks, then it converts your text into uh, italic format. Okay, so this is the Hardamard gate. And now what we want is we want to ask what is the action of the Hardamard gate on a given state, right? So how do we do that? All right, so now that we have entered uh, our expression for a Hardamard gate, let's see how it will act on a quantum state. So before that, let's uh, write down what the mathematical expression for a typical quantum state looks like. And it looks something like this. Uh, and to enter math, uh, we can either use a begin uh, and end align environment. We can also use dollar signs. So if I use, if I put something, an expression between single dollar signs that is known as inline math, if I use double dollar signs that is known as display math. And you will see what the difference is by looking at some examples. So what does a typical quantum state look like? And we'll use the Dirac ket adjoint ket notation. Um, so if I want to write a ket in LaTeX, what would I do? Well, I would think that I would say something like this, right? I would put a vertical bar and an X and then a right angle bracket. But that doesn't look very pretty, does it? I mean, look. It doesn't look really pretty. Okay, so let me try something in LaTeX. Uh, instead of a vertical bar, I'll use a command, uh, LaTeX command, which is vert slash vert, vert for vertical, then X is our argument. And then for the uh, closing bracket, I'll use uh, R angle, okay? Now you can compare the two expressions on the right, which one is prettier. Obviously the one at the bottom is prettier. But now here's the issue. You don't want to go about typing every single time you want to write down a cat. You don't want to go about typing slash word, argument, et cetera, et cetera, slash R angle. And by the way, uh, this is also how one would type an adjoint. All one has to do is the L angle and word, okay? So when you see, you get a nice adjoint cat expression. So of course you don't want to go do this all the time. So there's a very nice uh, uh, property of LaTeX, which is that you can define custom commands. Custom commands are basically, uh, you can think of them as functions or subroutines. So for instance, I can define a custom command, uh, which will insert a cat for me and I will show you how that works. So if I just like this slash get X, you see that it has inserted, it has generated a, this X. Now, where did this slash get X come from? This is not part of the standard LaTeX distribution and it's not part of the standard um, um, LaTeX that comes with, with the collab. So it is a part of a certain bun, certain set of commands that I have defined myself. Anybody can do this. There's, it's not a big deal at all. Uh, so this is just another text cell, uh, another code, uh, not a code cell, a text cell. And in this, I put uh, a bunch of math commands. So each one of these definitions goes inside a dollar sign and it looks like this, as, as you can see. Uh, so let me go with the definition. So you say, you begin a new command in this way. You say backslash, a uh, new command, and then uh, you enter the name of the command. So the name of the command, okay. The name of the command is going to be cat, right? So I want to enter backslash cat. And then 
uh, one can enter the number of arguments that you want to pass to this command. Okay, so there are cases in which you want to have an expression uh, which takes two arguments, for example, the inner product, right? So I have a command called inner p, which takes two arguments, uh, but the cat command only takes one. And uh, here in the next set of curly braces, we have our code, which begins with slash word. And then when I'm in the placeholder for the first argument, I put a, this expression, which is the hash sign, hash one, and then slash r angle. So what this does is, so I put this in one of my uh, text, text cells, and I press shift enter and you see it's all rendered. And since it's just a bunch of command definitions, there's nothing to show, right? So it just shows uh, as a bunch of empty space. Um, but when I come to my cells over here, where I want to write down my quantum state, right? All I need to do is write down slash get x and I get a nice get out of it, okay? So, and then what I want is slash get psi because well, we use psi for quantum states. Uh, and uh, well, we are working with qubits. So quantum states have two components, right? And we'll write those two components in the form of a column vector. Uh, so now we need uh, some nice command to do that quickly. The long way would be the following. You say begin B matrix, and then you enter the right. So this would be the long way to uh, write down uh, the state of a system. Okay, and one second, which one? So this I want, yeah, P matrix, that's right. This should also be a P matrix. P I suppose stands for parentheses. And you can see it gives me a nice two component object, but of course I don't want to do this again and again. So what do I do? Well, I write a custom command. So I go to my cell, which is at the very beginning of my notebook, I enter new command, right? And then I want a custom command. Uh, so what should I call uh, this command? Let's see, uh, I want to create a, a column vector and uh, it's I'm going to have uh, two elements, right? Uh, so let me just call it uh, slash, Q cat, Q stands for well, qubit, okay? And it's going to take two arguments. And then we have our code here, begin P matrix, right? And then the first element, ampersand, second element, uh, oops, first element, new line, second element, and then end P matrix. And then we close our code and put a dollar sign, right? And we press shift enter so that all of this is processed and goes into the memory. Okay, so now I want to, let's see if that works, okay? So let's say get slash psi prime is equal to slash q get. Now all I have to do is put in the arguments as alpha beta, let's see. Okay, so I was making uh, a bit of a boo-boo there. Uh, the correct way to write, uh, to call a macro, uh, which takes two arguments. The, what I was doing was I was writing uh, the usual programming language style, curly braces, then argument list, but LaTeX is funny. So it takes the arguments as a sequence of curly brace uh, enclosed uh, expression. So I should write qket curly brace slash alpha curly brace slash beta. And you can see it renders uh, my expression very nicely. 
now I want to see what happens uh, when I act on the uh, on a quantum state with a Hadamard gate. Okay, so what do I want to do? I'm going to write H and then my state get psi and this is equal to, well, what happens to, uh, to get psi? You can multiply a column vector by uh, this matrix. And the answer is actually quite easy to write down, which is, oops, let me be a little bit more careful. And one more thing, I forgot a fraction of one by square root of two. in my definition of the Hardamard gate. So once I have that, and since one by root two occurs so often in all of my expressions, you know what? I'll put a macro for that. Command, and then root two, and I'm not sure that's more efficient uh, than writing square root of two, um, but we'll just go with it for the time being. So we write two Q ket, and well, what happens to the arguments here? And the arguments become slash alpha plus beta comma. Oops, not the comma sign again. Curly brace slash alpha minus slash beta end equation. And there you go. That's that's our our equation looks like, right? So if you multiply uh, the quantum state, uh, which has these two components, alpha, beta, with the Hardamart matrix, uh, well, this is what you get. You just get another state where the components are linear combinations of alpha and beta, right? So the uh, first element will be alpha plus beta and the second one will be alpha minus beta. Okay, great. Uh, but now, uh, most often uh, we don't deal with arbitrary quantum states, we deal with our computational so-called case states in the computational basis, right? Uh, so computational basis. And so let's write down what those states are. Uh, well, First one is get zero and it is the state which has just a one in the first row. And then we have the, the one state which has the one in the second row. All right, so, so these are the two uh, computational basis states for a single qubit, right? And now we want to see what happens when we act on these states uh, with the Hardamard gate. So if I say Hardamard slash get zero, uh, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to get the following slash root two, slash q cat and then one one okay and this makes sense right because if you look at the Hardamard action is alpha plus beta and alpha minus beta now if you look at the zero state beta is zero alpha is one so you just get alpha alpha right uh, but there is uh, 
a somewhat nicer way to write this, which is as the sum of one zero state and or the up state and the down state, right? So this is this is what happens to the zero state when it when it's acted on by the Hardamard gate. You get a linear superposition of zero and one. And similarly, as you can probably imagine, when you act on the one state or the down state, you get another linear superposition, but with a minus sign. Uh, so there's a relative phase difference of 180 degrees between these two components, right? So this is what uh, the Hardamard gate does uh, to our quantum state. All right, great. So what we have done in so far is we have created a quantum circuit with two quantum qubits and two classical qubits. And then we have inserted the Hardamard gate in the first qubit. Right. So what, what is going to be the effect of the Hardamard gate? Well, if you enter, uh, if the input of the first qubit is, let's say, zero, then the Hardamard gate is going to put, uh, put, throw out the combination zero plus one. And if it's some arbitrary state alpha beta, then you're going to get this result. All right, so what's the next step uh, in what we're trying to do here? Well, uh, we want to end, we want um, to we will be following this help text. So let's go to that really quick, which has the code. Okay, so this is this help text shows that we put one hard demand gate. All right, that's great. And now this, what is the second command? So let's do that. The second command is circ dot cx. Okay. And what is cx? Cx stands for, for control not, right? Because the not operation is given by the poly x gate. So that's why it's just cx instead of c not. Uh, and that's because you can also have a cy and a cz. So rather than using c not, it's, you know, cx is used in this definition. And cx takes control not takes one qubit as its control. So here we make the first qubit as a control qubit. And you can see this help menu has popped out. This is the control qubit. And then we have a target qubit. Uh, that's one, all right? So this is our circuit. Okay, great. Now, uh, let's draw the circuit again and see what we have. Excellent. So you can see that what a circuit does is the following. It takes two qubits, it acts with the Hardamard gate on the first qubit, and it then it uh, applies a C0 operation to both of these qubits. All right. And now we can uh, ask, well, what does, how does all of this look uh, mathematically? Okay, so we'll assume that both of our input qubits are in the in the uh, in the up state or the zero state, and ask what is the end result of this of this operation. All right. So let's uh, do some math. Okay. So first of all, what is the result of the Hardamard gate acting on the zero state? Well, the Hardamard gate acting on the zero state in the first qubit will give me this result. Okay, so that's just one, one as a column vector, right? So my, my first qubit, okay, and I'll write it like this. Let's say get Q1 is equal to Q get one, and well, there's a root two factor, so let's not forget that. Okay. Oops. 
again with the braces. Okay, and then uh, let's write down the expression for the second qubit. All right, hold on, buddy. Quad, get Q2. And if this quad expression, what it does is it puts some spacing between two expressions, right? So I want some spacing over here. That's what this is, it's a quad space. And then the root two, Q kit. Uh, and well, my second qubit, remember, is in the up state, right? So it's just one zero. All right, so these are my, uh, these are my two, two qubits. And so what is the combined state of the system? The combined state of the system, uh, you have to remember, can be written as a tensor product. So the tensor product is this symbol, which is o, o times, right? Because it's the time symbol surrounded by an O. Okay. So this is how you would write Q1 tensor Q2 in LaTeX. And now this is a four by four matrix. Okay, so how do I, uh, what do I do now? Well, I just write down a four by four matrix. Okay, begin P matrix and there's gonna be four numbers in this. Right, and so what happens when I take the tensor product of um, of these two states? Well, actually, it's a lot lot easier uh, to work with the with with the with this ket uh, with these ket expressions than with the uh, matrix expressions. Okay, uh, so before I do that. Uh, let me write down what my expressions are in the first place, right? So I get root two, then get zero plus get one, right? That's my first state, O times uh, slash get zero. Right, so this is what uh, my input state of the circuit is uh, after uh, the Hardamard operation is applied on the first qubit. And when you look at it in this form, it, it, it's actually quite much easier to deal with, mainly because of the distributive property of the tensor product. Property of tensor products. which is the following, that if you take the tensor product, you take the sum of two objects, and take the tensor product of that sum with the sum of two other objects, well, the tensor product distributes, right? So what do you get? You get A O times C, A O times D, B, C, that's B, O times D. Okay, so the tensor product has this really nice distributive property, right? And because of this distributive property, I can take an expression of this form. So let me. Copy and paste. And now I'll show you how to use the align environment to make my equations look pretty. Okay. So let me write down the expression first and then I'll tell you what's going on.
Okay, so you can see that I've taken my state Q1 tensor Q2, and I write it as a tensor product of zero plus one with zero, right? And you can see that, well, because of the distributed property, this becomes zero tensor zero, which is just a zero zero state, and one tensor zero, which is the one zero state. One zero state, there we go. So now one can ask, well, what does this look like in terms of uh, uh, matrices or uh, a column matrix? Well, let us remind ourselves uh, that a two qubit state is a four dimensional object uh, where the basis vectors uh, the computational basis vectors of a two qubit Hilbert space uh, as follows. Uh, and now in LaTeX, you will note that since the curly braces have a special role, if you want to insert a curly brace uh, itself in the text, then you have to escape it with a backslash. So these are our components of the four basis vectors. Right? So you have get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And an arbitrary state in the two qubit Hilbert space can be written as, uh, let's see. Well, I haven't really bothered to define anything, so I'll just go with P matrix. I think it's too much trouble to do anything else. So we, we can write it in terms of components. And I will just use alpha beta, gamma, Delta Okay, so this is the expression for a vector in a two qubit Hilbert space. What are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta? They're the coefficients of these component vectors, of these basis vectors, alpha zero, zero, uh, beta zero, one, gamma, one, zero, one, and delta one, one. So this, this, expression can also be written as slash alpha get zero zero and slash beta get zero one. Okay, so this the these two these expressions are completely equivalent. All right. So now we can look at uh, the expression that we had earlier, right? This tensor product state Q1 tensor Q2, which is what we got when we took our two up states and put the first qubit through a Hardaman gate. Right. So when you do that, the output is this linear combination 0, 0, and 1, 0. Now, if you look at uh, this expression for the two qubit state, you can see that this would correspond to having uh, alpha and gamma equal to one by root two and beta and delta to be zero, okay? Uh, so, So this tells us uh, that if I take this expression, I can also write it as a matrix uh, which takes 
So I'll put a one by root two R outside and eight one zero one zero and matrix. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't even put a dollar sign and it's still showing me um, the LaTeX. Well, that, that's, that's good, I guess. That's uh, good to know. What did I just do? So let's do something silly. Okay. Right, so this state can be written as one, zero, zero, one. All right, so most often we won't really be working with uh, this explicit matrix representation unless we really need to. All right, so now let's see what happens when you put a C naught gate in front of these two qubits, All right? Now, what is the effect of a C naught gate? Let's see. Okay, so C naught gate does the following, right? If the first qubit, the control qubit is zero, the second qubit is untouched. And if the first uh, qubit is one, the second qubit is flipped, all right? So uh, what is, uh, we can write like this in markdown, we put input, and output. So if you want to create a table in Markdown, what do you do? I believe you use uh, uh, these vertical bars. All right, so this is what the C naught gate does. Right, it takes the zero zero state and the zero one state and doesn't do anything to them. It takes one zero to one one and one one to one zero. All right, easy peasy. So what we now need to figure out is what happens when the C naught gate acts on on this expression. Okay, so let's let's do that. And. What was our expression? Let's just see. Right, it was this expression. Uh, K zero zero. K four. K. Right. So, what does the C naught gate do to these states? Right. You can see that the zero zero state will be unchanged and the one zero state will become one one, right? So what happens uh, when you take C naught and you act on all of this? So let me just put brackets here. Well, all that happens is that second the second component just changes to one. So this is our state. All right, so what have we accomplished so far? We have built a circuit uh, which takes in as its input, um, well, you can put in any input, but if you send in two up states, that means two states uh, in this, which are both zero, and you apply a Hardamar to the first state, and then you apply a C naught to the first state, what does that give you? Well, that gives you what is known as a bell state or an entangled state. So we can write this as beta zero zero because that is the notation 
that is used in Nails and Chuang. Right, I'll stop here for today. And I hope that uh, this has given you a start in both Google Collab, in LaTeX and Python. So I guess that's a lot of ground to cover. All right, see you in the next video. Don't forget to leave your uh, comments and press the like button and subscribe. All right, happy coding.